Now that for me and, and my group of friends, any guy in my group of friends that still can't like get a, a girlfriend or something, it's like now it's very clear that it's because of drawing personality flaws. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, we, like well, because this is the thing, we were all awkward. So when I was 15, I was, I'm an awkward man, but I still figured out parts of life. You know what I mean? So then I'll talk to some of my friends and be like, man, you just can't figure women out. And I'm like, nah, dog, you 30. Like, this is. <laughs> Something should be happening, you know what I mean? You can't just be like, I'm scared to talk to girls because women are afraid of you. Like, it's, I don't know what you need to be doing. I don't know if you need therapy or sunlight, but like something has got to give if we gonna keep hanging out, you know? And I think I found one thing, one really important thing that that's probably one of the biggest things when you, when you move out, like as, as, just as a guy, when you go out into the world on your own for the first time to, to, to make something yourself. And when you have your first like domain, right? Your first place where you're like, this is my place. Whether it's an apartment, a house, what, whatever you have. It's so important, as, as men, we have to, I, I cannot stress this enough. We have to invest in at least one stick of furniture, all right? Like, a lack of furniture is killing us out here. Everything cannot be on the floor. Everything cannot, I can't say it enough, everything cannot be on the floor. Because when you bring a woman back to your place and then she opens the door and then you walk in and she sees a bowl on the floor, she's like, ooh, okay, he gonna kill me. Um, I picked wrong, that was my bad. He didn't even have a murdery face, but. A bowl on the floor makes it look like she not gonna be here long and neither are you. This is where you bring people to kill people. It just, I, I, I can't sh stress it enough. I know that we don't care. We don't care, we're happy. It takes very little for us to be happy. We're happy. But if you plan on having any female companionship, I'm not, I don't even mean sex. If you just plan on having female freak, then you need to be able to put your things on things. Like, that's not a crazy ask. Just, it's, the amount of dudes that I, the amount of friends I have that don't have a chair <laughs> is so distra- I understand if you don't have a dining set. I understand if you don't have a bunch of chairs. But you live here. <laughs> don't you want to sit? Like, this is just one chair. I don't know. Please don't put your bo books on the floor. Please do not put your books on the floor. You can have the thickest books. You could have War and Peace and Paradise Lost next to each other. But if they are on the floor, she's gonna be like, he can't read, he can't read. <laughs> That's a door stop. That's not, he not cracking that open. That's a paperweight. No? You don't even need, you don't even need books. If you had a bookshelf and put two magazines on, she'd be like, what a cultured individual. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just saying, where, like, the amount of friends I have that are oblivious about this. Like, I'll have a buddy call me. I'll ask him about his day. I'm like, how'd your day go? He's like, man, it was all right. We were having a good time. Went out for dinner and everything. Then she get back to my place. She want to get all uppity and leave. I was like, you brought her to... You brought her to your place. You brought her to the place that we hang out. You brought her to the place that I've been, where you live, where you sleep. I'm surprised she didn't call the police. Because that's my thing. It's just... Where, where, where your things are in relation to the floor is where it looks like you are in life. <laughs> so I'm just saying, just elevate, just to table height, just elevate. There are good men. There are good, good looking men that are good men that are a good table away from a good woman. All right, <laughs> you're so close. It's not even your personality. It's the fact that w it, it's the fact that it looks like you live outside, inside. That is <laughs> what is doing you in. Like, I, like I get it. I, yeah, I was, I was broke. When I, when I moved to Chicago, I had no money. And I got my first place, and I slept on an air mattress, which was the floor. The air separating you between the floor and where you are. That's not real bed. That's, that's floor. It is floor. I can admit that. That's floor, right? So I was sleeping on the floor with some comfort, okay? So I get it. 
when you go out into the world on your own for the first time, make something of yourself, you may not have all the money, you may not come from money, you may not have resources. I'm not telling you to get the whole IKEA set up immediately or anything. I'm just saying you should have enough furniture that if you bring a woman back to your place, you have just enough going on to look like you were robbed. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Just when, when you bring her back to your place and you have to make the bookshelf everything, you got to make it the kitchen cabinet, you gotta, so then she sees a bunch of forks on the bookshelf and her face start to screw up, you can turn around and be like, they got me. They got me. I knew this wasn't a good neighborhood, okay? Let's go to your place where it's safe, baby girl. <laughs> Jamie? <laughs> okay. I have to leave soon. I, um, did y'all see the, uh, the Alaska flight? <laughs> the Alaska Airlines, okay, if you didn't see it, basically uh, a piece of window popped off of the flight, mid-flight, it was still flying, it was still in the air, and some window came off, and then just a bunch of plane came off, like, like a door's worth of plane, came, it might have been the door, a door's worth of plane came off, and I have been so shaken, because... We've been shitting on Spirit for a minute. We, we really let Spirit have it all, and they have not had one of these happen. The whole plane get there with you when you fly Spirit. Like the whole, the plane that left is the plane that arrives. And you. That didn't seem like a lot to ask before, but now you really got to wonder, right? And it just is, is so, it's so crazy because I know there were people screaming in videos and people crying and stuff like that. But by and large, everybody was so calm. It makes me wonder if we, as, if it's an American thing, if we are so bloody, if we are just so traumatized from life in America that a plane can start to come apart mid-flight and you're like, well, I did pay $68, so I guess... <laughs> That's fair. That makes sense. I didn't pay for the whole plane to get here. You know what I mean? I paid for just me. And right now, I'm still headed there. So I guess they're fulfilling their contractual obligation to get me somewhere. I don't know. I guess I didn't pay to survive. I just, I just gave them the money to get on. So I, that's, that's my, I should specify next time that I want to get there in one piece as well as the plane. Yeah. Blown away. Because the wor that's the worst airline for it to happen on. Because they don't, when you, imagine if you're taking a nap. You, you mid-nap, right? Because you, you got a nap on an Alaskan flight. You have to, because they don't have the TVs. They don't have the TVs, so the only thing to entertain you is your dreams, all right? <laughs> So then you, you, go, you go to sleep, and then you wake up, and everybody's screaming, and it is louder, right? <laughs> it is just louder in here now, and a little cold, because we are, we are in space. <laughs> that is way too high to be losing some plane, do you know what I mean? And it just, everyone was so calm, even in the post-interview after, when they landed, and then they were asking people what it felt like, what was happening. There were people, there was one woman, I understand that she was probably nervous, and so she was nervous giggling, but there was one woman who was acting like it was Six Flags ride. Like, she was just like, <laughs> just like, yeah, and then a little piece came off, and then, I don't know, we were all like, what do we do? You know, and like, <laughs> I don't know, I had no idea. Like, it was just, it was so crazy. This has never happened before. Like, has it happened to you before? I don't know. I've been on Greyhound buses <laughs> where people got more upset about a dump in the bathroom than these people got about a piece of plane flying off. As Americans, we gotta start acting like we used to something. Like this, this is really distressing. That they beat us bloody so much in our travel experiences that we're like, yeah, uh, I guess I guess I'll choose aisle from now on. Uh, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's what's up. Because then, one of the most amazing things, this is a miracle. This is genuine miracle. I'm very happy that no one on the flight was hurt. But then, there were two seats. The two seats next to where the plane decided to stop being a plane. Those two seats were empty because those two people missed their flight. Which is incredible, right? You, you love a story like that. It does make me wonder... 
about that third person because that means that third person was sitting there. <laughs> like, did they take a nap and just wake up like, what the fuck? What the fuck? Like, where do you go from here? Like, okay, so I have to, I'm going to Montana this weekend, and both my flights were Alaska. <laughs> both of them were Alaska, and I didn't even have enough self-respect to switch airlines. They had to call me. <laughs> they, they had to call me. At midnight last night, they had to call me and be like, it's not gonna happen, dog. Like, I was like, <laughs> It, that's the closest to a breakup I felt in a long time. Like, I didn't have the self-respect to leave, and then they had to be like, you not for us. You know, Did everybody have a good 4th of July? Yeah. I, I did I did decent. It was it was a fine time, you know, but like Fourth of July is there's two groups in America that are very conflicted with Fourth of July. And it's uh black people and dogs. Like both of us just <laughs> the whole day we don't know how to feel. The whole day is fucked up. If you and I'm a black dude with a dog, so I was looking at my dog all day like I know. Like it's <laughs> Both of us just gotta watch white people have the best day of their lives. And he's like, oh God, okay. <laughs> and the dogs don't know how I feel about 4th of July because there's a barbecue, but also there's fireworks. So you might get some good scraps, but what is going on up there? Like, <laughs> every dog is British on 4th of July. Every dog is like, what the fuck are they doing? And it's, t it's tough for me, because it's like, when you, when you know, I don't know, it's like the day of my country's independence, but not mine. Isn't that weird? It's like, you can't even really, because they don't really teach about it, but like, black people fought in the American Revolution. Like, black people fought for the country to be free. And then we were like, yeah, we're free. And then somebody was like, what do you mean, we? <laughs> you know? I know, I know. It must be hard to hear. <laughs> Keep telling them. Uh, Keep telling them. Appreciate you. <laughs> Keep telling them like you're black too. That's the funniest. <laughs> you're my favorite. I love you so much. Thank you for that. that was... Keep fucking get they ass. <laughs> I, I only know what it's like to be me. The hardest life you're ever going to have to live is your own. So I don't know what it's like to date as anybody else. And I, and I can't judge. I'm not even going to try to project. I, I will say, just being me, it's been hard enough. So I, a, a woman dating men is an unenviable position. I can't even imagine what that's like, you know, because men be out here killing. <laughs> that's, that's, look. When it, when it comes to dating, everyone, don't let the podcast fool you. Don't let your friends get in your ear. Everyone is doing everything. Men and women both cheat. Men and women both manipulate. It, it's all, there's no like one-sided thing except the killing is us. That is, <laughs> that we be doing that shit for real. That is like, it's a, it, even if women wanted to catch up, it would take till 22-22 to <laughs> really match our numbers. We out here crazy as fuck killing this wild. And so I, I can't imagine what it's like to then be a woman trying to date men and find somebody that you vibe with that also doesn't kill. Because remember, when they catch these killers, everybody talking about how nice and polite they were. They were, outside the killing, they were some good men. Do you know what I mean? So now you a woman out here trying to find a man that's like, you know, nice, treats you well, not... Not dangerous, but a little dangerous. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, you know, you a little bit of that, like. <laughs> a 
That's, that's my favorite. That's it. I don't, I don't know why, but anytime I've been like about to hook up with somebody and they put my hand on their throat for me, I'm like, oh, you think I'm a bitch out there? That's crazy. <laughs> That's wild. You feel so safe with me. You put my hand on your throat. That's that's almost insulting. That's a little like, let me do what I was going to do and then we figure out if, you know, like, don't just be like, let me help. Like, that's so insulting. It's crazy. And then another part of me very much likes it because you're helping me help you. Like, it's like, that is that does low key. It, I'm insulted, but it does feel like a cheat code where I'm like, Oh, and then this? Like, it's, <laughs> you know, but it is, it's, it's t- I cannot imagine. It really is tough, because then you, you know, it, it, how do I put it? I'm not trying to be like, oh, poor, you know, poor men or whatever, but then you got to be that person. You have to be someone who's interesting, nice, engaging, charismatic, and prove you don't kill. And trying to prove you don't kill make you look like a killer every time. All right? <laughs> Please believe me. The, mo- the most murdery looking people are the people who are trying to convince you they don't kill. Imagine somebody ask you, hey, you want, do you want to do something later and it's safe? That's... <laughs> Why would you say that? <laughs> Why would you even bring it up? That's crazy. But it's also kind of crazy not to bring it up. It's like... <laughs> real tightrope to walk I thought I was doing well I thought I was doing so good because I would I would hear I have have so many different you know friends out here dating men and women I hear all the stories and so I I was aware I was like sometimes when women go out with a guy for the first time they don't really know him they met him on an app or something they end up like sharing their location with their friends you know or they end up texting like hey this is where I'm So I was on the date. Date was just starting. I was like, hey, do you want to text your friends where we're going? Like, (laughs) Just to let her know I wouldn't be offended. But then as soon as I said it, I was like, ah. (laughs) That sounds like we going to the woods. (laughs) God damn. Then then I'm like, you know I'm not crazy or anything. Which, why would you say that? That's, it's still bad. Did y'all, by the way, have y'all been in this whole Jonah Hill thing that's been trending? Yeah, a little bit. Some shaking heads. All right. So if if you don't know about it, I'm going to try to sum it up in two sentences. Basically, Jonah Hill's ex-girlfriend has put out in, in her story their old text to each other. And it's it it's a lot of him being like, why you got to be around men? It's like it's it's a lot of just like why you, she's a surfer and it's like why you got to surf with men and it's like nonstop and it, he's clearly in lots of the text having like some sort of moment where he's like very scared she gonna cheat or something, but it's like the texts don't make sense. Like she may have cherry picked some texts to make him look extra bad, but he still texts what he texts. So then. It's just him texting like, why you got to surf, and he, and he surfing, and y'all might surf on each other, all right? And then if y'all surf it on each other, you might get surf in your mouth, and then you come home, and you just covered in surf, and it's like, you can't be surfing without me, bitch. Like, it was just, when you read them, you're like, oh, no, <laughs> this is not good, you know? And there's been a lot of backlash and everything. I just think that Jonah Hill committed the cardinal sin of telling a woman what to do when he's not that good looking. Like, <laughs> that's, that's kind of all he did, really. When you think about it, when you read all the text, if that had been John Hamm and he was like, I don't really want you around other dudes, you'd be like, uh, okay, daddy. All right. Like, <laughs> just throwing it out there. Maybe. You know? Because it's hard. It's so, it's so difficult. Building a relationship now is still one of... It's always been difficult. But now we live in a more convenient era of civilization. It used to be maintaining uh, some sort of relationship and just surviving were like the two hardest things to do. It was like, keep, you know, keep your spouse happy and don't get malaria. was like... <laughs> 
was like the two hardest things to do. And then we evolved and we evolved and we evolved. But now it, interpersonal relationships are as difficult as they've ever been, but everything else is easier, which actually makes them more difficult. Because our life is so convenient now that as soon as someone is an inconvenience, you're like, well, why would I even deal with you? Then you're done. And nobody's happy. It's hard. I think the thing that makes being with someone harder than it's ever been is definitely podcasts. <laughs> it is. It is. And it, it goes both ways. It truly does. All these podcasts are it's like, don't listen to anybody, bitch. You're a fucking queen, okay? And if he tells you that you drink too much, he doesn't fucking party enough, all right? Don't let him fucking stop you from living your life and being the boss babe that you were born to be in your soul. You are a fucking Sagittarius, bitch. You cannot be stopped, all right? Live your fucking life. You walk on air and angel dust, okay? And then on the other side, you have dude, bruh. Bruh. Bro, a girlfriend? You gonna get a girlfriend? <laughs> you gonna get a girlfriend and talk about she trying to improve your life? She's trying to change you, dog. She's trying to try get you to eat vegetables? <laughs> Bro, she gets you eating vegetables? Are you serious? She gets you eating vegetables out here? Pause, dog. All right? Try to get you to eat vegetables. Everybody know vegetables gay. <laughs> If vegetables ain't gay, why they all shaped like dick, all right? <laughs> Think about that. Zucchini, all right? Cucumber, that's a hard one, all right? <laughs> but that's what it is. It's just people, huge influencers, people with huge followings telling people don't communicate with anyone, don't settle with anyone, everyone is against you, they're all trying to get one over on you, and it's coming from everywhere, so then, yeah. You listen to that shit going to work every day, it's gonna be pretty hard on a first day. <laughs> you know, it makes it tough. And it's a shame. I don't I don't know I don't know what to do with that information. Just any time somebody start telling me about a podcast, I just I just start screaming. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It'll break my heart too. It'll be a smartest person you know, be like, you, you know, you had some good points. It's like, ah, I lost my friend. God damn. What a fucking shame. I've been watching the news and I saw that Kevin McCarthy lost his speakership. He's not House Speaker anymore. And I was watching, and I'm, I'm not going to lie, I didn't really care. It didn't affect me in my mind at all. What I got upset about was after he got fired, he gave a 30 minute speech to the press. Why do we need that? <laughs> we all just watched you get fired. Slowly. On national TV. We watched them vote to fire you. Fired. 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 We watched it happen. What could you possibly have to tell us? And I was upset because he shouldn't get that. A 30 minute speech after he's fired. He should not get that. We should get that. <laughs> Think about it. You get fired from your job. And then you have 30 minutes for an exit speech. <laughs> to say whatever's on your mind. <laughs> Imagine you get fired and you work at Taco Bell. And now the floor is yours for half an hour. You just walk up. Thank you all so much for your time. Um, he steals, okay? He's a thief. We all know it. Y'all firing at me, but all right. He steals every day, okay? Also, these two that you keep putting on shift together, they fuck in the fridge, all right? I've walked in several times. Everybody, don't eat the chalupa or the crunch wrap. The tortillas are compromised. Every forgotten job should have that thing. You know what I mean? Let's say you, you're a mail worker, UPS, FedEx, post office, and they fire you. Then you get 30 minutes to just let them have it. You walk up and you're like, okay, you're going to fire me, but all right, all right, cool. Just so y'all know, most of the mail is dildo. All right? So if I go, nobody comes, all right? <laughs> Thankless jobs you get. You're a social worker, and they fire you. You get 30 minutes to speak to the public. You just walk out, and you're like, all right, you want me to go? I'm going to go. There's only three of us. <laughs> so good luck. <laughs> also, that kid over there, serial killer, all right? Just watch him. Because it's not like he even gave a good speech. McCarthy's speech was horrible. He started his speech. You can look it up by being like, 
I didn't get good grades in school. <laughs> Why would you open with that? That's basically that dude walking up being like, I'm dumb as hell, y'all right, y'all right. I should have never had this shit. I saw another story that, okay. A rich, there was a rich guy that died and um, they were reporting it on the news because he, he died when his little plane went down. That's what the news was calling it, his little plane crash and then and he passed away when his little plane hit the ground and everything they just kept saying little plane over and over again and i was like just say jet like it was a jet like, you know what i mean like little plane that's crazy like i understand why they say little plane they said little plane so we feel bad for him because if they say a guy died when his little plane went down you're like oh what a tragedy if they say a rich guy died on his jet you're like good that's i'm just saying it you know but they just kept saying little plane, and the tone they had was weird. They were just like, die on his little plane with his little dick. Like, it just felt weird. It felt like he, like he was the anchor's ex or something. Like, it just had that ex energy. Like, he died on his little ass plane. Little broke ass. It was rented, by the way. He didn't own a plane. It's odd. Just say Jet. It's more respectful to just say Jet. We don't know this man's story. I look at myself, I come from Louisiana and I don't come from money. If I ever raise my net worth to the point of being able to afford a jet and I buy a jet and then I crash land in my jet and I die and then they're reporting it on the news and they say Josh died on his little plane, I will come back to life just to whoop ass. That is crazy. Call it a jet. That's what it is. I don't know why I'm so passionate about this. <laughs> I even had a friend be like, no, just because it's a little plane doesn't mean it's a jet. I'm like, it was his plane. Anyone who owns a plane is doing pretty well. <laughs> you know, it's like not like owning a little boat. You can own a canoe and still be poor. <laughs> you know? That just means you have enough wood to stay afloat. But if you are going in the clouds whenever you feel like, that's money. <laughs> a little plane. My favorite story though, my favorite thing that happened was uh, Paris Fashion Week. If y'all aren't familiar, Paris has Fashion Week and all these people, people high up in the fashion world, rich people, celebrities, they all descended on Paris for a week to see and be seen and stuff. And while they were there, there was an outbreak of bed bugs, <laughs> which is hilarious. <laughs> It couldn't be. You gathered all the richest people in the world together in one place and gave them bed bugs? Are we sure this wasn't an activist? You sure this wasn't Greta Thunberg trying new things? You know what I mean? Just her sitting there like, you take a jet, you pay the price. You know? Could have been. We don't know. But it was amazing. They gave all those rich people bed bugs. It made me laugh so hard because it's fashion week. So half of them dress like bed bugs to begin with. So like, bed bugs probably thought it was mating season. You know what I mean? They were seeing them walk by like, okay, come through thickness. I'm gonna take a bite of you later. But no, people from Fashion Week spoke to the press and the public. People from the local government spoke to the press and the public and everything. And mostly everyone was trying to maintain a sense of calm the entire time, right? We're very sorry that this is happening. This is now a reflection on our beautiful city. Uh, we're doing our best to move people. Just please stick with us, right? But there was one person that was my favorite. Um, the deputy mayor also spoke to the public and the press. But when the deputy mayor came out, he was like, um, it's an outbreak. <laughs> no one is safe. What kind of leader says no one is safe? We just came out of a global pandemic where no country's leader said no one is safe, even when no one was safe. That's crazy. Then the mayor, because the mayor came out, she was ready. She was like prim proper. She made me feel reassured. I wasn't even in Paris, right? And then she got this assistant ass mayor behind her. No one is safe. She's probably like, get him out of here. It's crazy. No one is safe. Every leader I've ever had has tried to maintain a sense of calm in a crisis. I remember when I was in middle school, in English class, and English class was after lunch. 
And I had seen this kid at lunch, and he had a nasty-ass lunch. I don't know what it was, but as soon as I saw it, I was like, he gonna be sick. That is disgusting. And so then I sat as far away from him as I could, corner, corner of the classroom. And then middle of class, sure enough, his stomach started bubbling. And we all hear it. He's just over here taking notes like... <laughs> looking at us like, y'all don't hear me, right? It's like, of course we hear you. His stomach is loud as hell. And then in the middle class, he jumps up and runs out and on the way to running out because he was very sick he threw up on the back of like seven kids heads and our teacher said calm down i know y'all just got thrown up on let me get some towels it's gonna be fine she didn't say no one is safe you see what i mean i worked at an italian restaurant that burned down right it burned down and even as the head chef was trying to put the flames out on his back no one yelled no one is safe we just tried to put this man out actually one of my favorite things about when that happened was okay so chef is on fire right like, and then the line cook ran out to the dining hall where everybody else was and then just yelled to the whole dining hall we on fire motherfuckers <laughs> Which is like as informative as it is unhelpful. Like, he's telling them the details, but not enough to get them moving. Also, we are not on fire, just he is on fire. Some of the building is on fire, but mostly as we, it's just him. He on fire by himself, right? And so no one knows what to do, because even if someone ran in now, it's like, we on fire, motherfuckers. You wouldn't immediately jump up and run. They looked at him and they were like, so is he on drugs or what's that? And it wasn't until the chef ran out behind him out the door with a couple flames still on his back that everybody cleared out. He yelled, we on fire, motherfuckers. He didn't yell, no one is safe. <laughs> what would even possess you to put the words to get to the public, no one is safe? <laughs> okay. Like what I think about, now that I think about it, I think that was that Deputy Mayor low-key admit he had bad bugs. That's what it was. It had to be. No one is safe. That means I'm not safe. That's, no one is safe. I wish there was video. There's no video of it happening. But the, you can tell that this is the case because anytime one of our leaders has to speak to us, they're calm because it's not their problem. That's what's happening. I grew up in Louisiana. Our, our whole state would get slammed by hurricanes and the governor would come on TV and be like, we're gonna, we're gonna stick in this together, all right? We're all in this together. He's clearly in Massachusetts, by the way. We're all in this together, all right? Y'all just stick with me, we're gonna get through this. You know what I mean? I think that dude freaked out because it was his problem. It's hard to stay calm when you're in the middle of something, you know? I wish there was video. There's no video. I wish he would just come out. Cause you know he yelled it. You know, he was like, no one is safe. It's happening to everybody, including really cool people who don't deserve this. <laughs> God damn, I wish there was a video just to see him be like, it's an outbreak, y'all. We doing our best, but this is bullshit. <laughs> you know, okay. It's, I'm trying to distill this idea for a minute, so just stick with me. It's difficult for all of us. Any, any, any person out here is just trying to do the best they can and try to be as good of a person, as useful of a person as they can. And I think one of the things that, especially like young dudes are running into, is that we don't need men to be men the way that we used to be. There's like this different man that the world needs now that we just don't know. It's like you don't need to be a caveman anymore, you know? And it's difficult because no one has shown exactly what that is and it has been co-signed on. So everybody's going their separate ways with everything. You know? Best example I can give is I, I knew a dude who, he's black, but he's like third generation suburbs. So he's not from the hood at all. <laughs> Not at all, right? But his, his girlfriend is, and, and she grew up in the hood, she still lives there. He was over at her place, right? And while they were there that night together, somebody broke in. It was terrifying. It was terrifying to be home for a burglary. That's something you want to come back home and just be like, they got us. <laughs> you 
you never want to be at home during the burglary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so then he, he doesn't even get a chance. He, he's like trying to process all of the stuff that's happening. They hear a window break. They hear somebody with like loud steps coming in through the window and everything. And before he can do anything, his girl just turns around and is like these trifling motherfuckers. Opens her nightstand, pulls out a gun, cocks it, and leaves the room. <laughs> He didn't even get the chance to be like, babe, it's okay, I'll go check it out. <laughs> She's gone. <laughs> She's gone, and he can hear her from the room. He can hear her kind of roasting them. Like, <laughs> just kind of, where your broke ass at? I got a gun too, ain't nobody scared. <laughs> Which is wild, because as a man, if you're in bed, and then your girl leaves the room to go get the burglar with the gun, you do kind of just pull the sheets up. <laughs> Cause all you can do now is cheer. Just be like, get him, baby. <laughs> Y'all been great. Thank you so much. You guys so much. I'll tell you what, though. I, I've been listening to uh, some of Beyonce's album, the new album, the country one. Um, and everyone has what feels like a lot of feelings. Like some people are like, this isn't country. Some people are like, what a beautiful country album. You know, so. And some people are just interested in it because they feel like um, someone as big as Beyonce making a country album brings brings people back to at least at least some semblance of the history of like black origins within country music, right? Because and 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 I don't expect everyone to know. I didn't know. My friend was telling me all of this stuff. I didn't just know this offhand. My friend was telling me that. Um, a lot of the instruments that come from early country, because like a lot of country comes from bluegrass, and so some of those bluegrass instruments were instruments that slaves made, right? Because they already had origins in West Africa. Things like the banjo, which were initially made with like gourds, stuff like that, like things that would later become the banjo, things that would become the fiddle, things that would become the tambourine that, that were infused in this bluegrass that became this country music. Also, while a lot of, um, a lot of the chanting from spirituals ended up as like choral elements and lyrics in some early country songs, and I thought that was so interesting. It's, it's, it's like weirdly buried because everything has to be such, such a, a, a binary for us. This is either black music or white music or anything. And I think people's, you know, people's contributions sometimes get diminished because of that. And then some people were talking about how it's important for Beyonce to make a country album because it, it is an overshadowing experience of a black person doing country that opens the door for more black people who are already doing country, right? and that there's been some resistance to that, which I, which a part of me does kind of get. Like if you're, if you're in country and you see Beyonce coming, <laughs> wouldn't you be like, we have to stop this. <laughs> this can't, come on. Don't, please. <laughs> you know what I mean? Something seems like super, super white, and then a black person comes, and they're like very talented in it, you know? You let Tiger play a little bit of golf. <laughs> and not, not only did he win all the titles, he banged all of your women. <laughs> Tiger alone, I, you know? And then you see Beyonce coming, you're like, can I have nothing? <laughs> So yeah, that's where the resistance is, is coming from. <laughs> you know. But that's why I find so fascinating about the origins of a lot of music in America. So much of that music comes originally in some aspect from slavery, whether it's like um, blues, country, you know, they're, they're, there are rock elements, there are jazz elements, there, there, it's, it's amazing that this horrific thing, this really horrible thing, what the people that it happened to turned it into is some of the most beautiful things that we have. I think that's incredible. 
I really do. I think about, I, th I actually think about it a lot because I don't think that everyone would be able to do that. Like what if the roles were reversed? What would the white spirituals be? Because we can't take this lightly. We cannot take this lightly. I know I've used the word already in the set, but slavery was an abomination of humanity. No person should ever be able to treat another person this way. And out of all of these horrors came some of the most beautiful things that we've ever heard. Even if just down connecting the lines, connecting the dots to a person that's alive now. They have this music because this thing happened and someone made something beautiful out of it. But what if it was reversed? <laughs> what if there were whites in the fields <laughs> tilling the earth under the hot sun, <laughs> which is not kind. <laughs> to white backs. <laughs> and as they are tilling this earth, they're trying to find something in all of this devastating trauma to exhale their hurt in a, as beautiful way of, as possible to build community among themselves. And they're tilling the earth as hard as they can, right? And then in the distance you hear, Just a small town guy. <sighs> Living in a lonely world. She took the midnight train. Go. Slave master Jamal comes out. What's that bullshit out here? I think that uh, one very, very important thing that we have to do as, as, as people, like as a country, to move forward is I think we have to genuinely decide who needs to be in jail. Do you know what I mean? Because this, this is my thing. We can all agree that you do need jail. Like, we've all met someone where it was like, mm, this feels like... <laughs> this feels like jail behavior. <laughs> I don't want to risk running into this in traffic. I need you out over here, right? So we all have an understanding of the, the purpose of jail, but we don't seem to agree on everything that someone should go to jail for, but there are some baseline things that we all agree someone should go to jail for. But then people do those things and then they don't go to jail. And then people do other things, things that we say are very bad, things that we say you should go to jail for, and then they go to jail. And then we do change the law <laughs> while they're in jail. Like I think about everybody who, you know, was in jail for weed possession in states where weed is currently legal. They went to jail, and I understand that they broke the law, but they went to jail, and then we decided, as people, because it's something that had to be voted on, that, no, nah, this thing shouldn't be illegal. And then they're sitting in jail like, so... <laughs> What about me? Oh, no? Okay, I'll stay. Wow. Like, I had a friend who went to jail for, uh, like, weed possession. 
right? And he did have a lot. <laughs> he, had, he had quite a bit on him. He had, I'll, I'll call it an entrepreneurial amount. <laughs> They popped his truck and they were like, oh, you're a businessman. <laughs> oh. And he went to jail and, he, and, you know, he said one of the craziest experiences was that when he got out and his friend came to pick him up and they were driving away from the jail, one of the closest things built near the jail was a dispensary. <laughs> and so he's like, uh. Maybe they're hiring. Because <laughs> you know? we all know people, in theory, who should be in jail and aren't. You know what I mean? We've all worked with somebody who we know is crazy. Somebody who is like, if anybody gonna shoot up the job, it's gonna be him. And we all know, people in different departments are like, have you met him? Stay away. Don't make eye contact. He crazy, right? Then you go home, you watching Hulu documentaries about true crime and stuff, and then you watching a documentary like, that's everything Kevin do. That is... <laughs> I guess we just have to wait for him to do something jail worthy, but um, all the general habits he does have. You know? I had my own experience. I was, I was at a, a diner, and I was, I was eating, Truly minding my own business. And then there was this guy sitting across from me. And the guy sitting across from me got his meal. And he had, he had soup. And I want to be clear, he had a spoon. That's very important. Everything I say next is unnecessary because he had soup and he had a spoon. All right? Everything required, soup and a spoon, he had it. God gave him everything he needed in this situation. A soup and a spoon to go with the soup. And... Rather than using the spoon like any normal, maybe tax-paying citizen, this man grabbed two forks, shoved them together, dipped them in the soup, lifted it up slightly, and was slurping it while maintaining eye contact with me. And as he did, I was like... Lock his ass up! Is he doing this? He doing something else? It was crazy as hell. <laughs> I'll be honest with y'all. I I don't smoke weed, but I let people think I do. Because it makes me make more sense to people. <laughs> like if I told you my thoughts and you knew I was sober, you'd be like, ooh, uh, is he slow or something? What's going on? Here? But if I told you my thoughts and you thought I was high, you'd be like, he really on to something. I like how he came in. That's fire right there. I'll give you an example right now. Like I would, I wish I could talk to bugs. <laughs> and not all the animals. I'm not trying to get input from everybody, just bugs. Because I feel like it would save a lot of lives, you know. Because how many times have you been at home chilling and in the corner of the room you just hear... <laughs> but if you could talk to bugs, if you could be like, hey, bruh, no. <laughs> not tonight. <laughs> I'm not in the mood. I'm gonna open the window, I'm gonna need you to leave. And then he'd be like, mm, sorry. But because we don't speak their language, it's just every time. It's just murders in your house. Let's say you bring somebody home, you have a date, date's going well, date comes back with you, your place, you in the Netflix portion of the Netflix and chill. You got the arm around, y'all making out, and then just a cockroach walk out to the middle of the room, if you could just be like, Carl, Carl, no. Not tonight, I got company here, come on now. Come on, bro, he'd be like, I'm sorry, I'm, that's my bad. 
even she'd be understanding. She'd be like, he had no way of knowing I was coming. That's like, uh, it happens. If I could talk to bugs, first bug that I talk to would be a praying mantis. I'd just walk up to him and be like, she ain't good for you, dog. <laughs> nah, don't do this. You and the boys for a little while. She just using you for your body, okay? <laughs> No, no, not even sex. You got a tasty ass head and she wants to eat you. I watch, I watch the news sometimes when I'm like not depressed enough, you know? <laughs> you know, sometimes you're having a good day, you turn on the news, you're like, let's see who else is having a good day. And the news is like, nobody. <laughs> nobody having a good day. Everybody dies. <laughs> So I turned on the news and I saw uh, Kamala Harris was in Jakarta and she was in an interview with a journalist and during the interview the journalist asked her if she would be ready, willing and able to take up the office of president if Biden was for whatever reason incapacitated and she said yes and it was just too quick that was that's way too fast and don't get me wrong that's literally her job her job to be there in case he not there she there right that's her whole job, but she said yes, like she'd been dropping banana peels at the White House for years. <laughs> That's way too fast. She said yes, like every time Biden get all some steps, her mouth water, just like, oh, okay, it's the day. All right, I'm gonna get my promotion. <laughs> oh, he about to miss that third step. Let me get the right pantsuit on. <laughs> she said it like just anytime she's walking down the stairs behind him, she sees her hair shaking, like she about to lean forward. <laughs> I could be a world leader. <laughs> and you could tell, she could tell she said yes too fast. Because she said, yeah. so then he asked her, she was like, yes, ooh. Like, she... <laughs> and so then she started backtracking, which just made it sound worse. She was like, I, 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 I'm just answering your hypothetical. Like, you the one over here asking a question about buying stronger than ever. <laughs> All right, calm down. <laughs> Um, do y'all see that they want to impeach Biden now? Do you see they're trying to open the investigation and impeach Biden? It's starting to feel like if you don't get impeached, you weren't really president. Like this, uh, <laughs> this starting to feel like street cred for presidents. You know what I mean? Like, they want to impeach you. Here's, here's my thing about Biden. And calm down, because I can already feel it. <laughs> For real, for real. Like, I said two words that already people were like, what? Like, it was... Just, this, this was so annoying about being American right now. You get, like, two words in and people try to suss out where you are. Like, we haven't done that since the Civil War. Like, chill out. I said two things. I just said, here's my thing about Biden. And immediately, I could feel y'all's eyes all be like, oh, I didn't know they invited Candace Owens' brother to do a set. <laughs> No, no, just here's, here's my thing about Biden. I don't, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like if you show me evidence, I'll consider something. I'm not the biased person. Maybe he doing everything that the Republicans say he doing, but when we look over him, he just look tired. Like, yeah, the, he doesn't look, I mean, I'm not even saying he can't be corrupt. I'm saying he doesn't look capable right now. He look... You know, maybe he's the worst criminal that we've ever had in the office, but when you look over him, he just looked like the Snoop Dogg of soup. Yeah, <laughs> yeah everything Snoop Dogg did for weed, Biden doing for soup right now. Like, you know, he making soup cool. He trying to get the kids into soup. You know what I mean? Like, no. It just feels, it feels odd, you know. Because it's like, maybe he's a criminal mastermind, but it feels like he's just hanging on. You know what I mean? That's a grandpa and we put him to work. That's, that we did that, you know? You can't possibly believe that Biden is this criminal mastermind, but then also anytime he make it through a speech, we're like, that was pretty good. That was, I don't know. No, he really crushed that. He didn't slip on any of the S's. That was well done, well done. You know what I mean? There was a couple of T's and he stuck them like Simone Biles. I'm really proud of it. Well done. No. 
There is one thing I will say, honestly, that Biden will be doing that's not on the up and up. If you watch as many press conferences as I watch with Biden talking, it's only when they ask him a good ass question he start acting senile. I'm not gonna lie. Like anytime they got a good ass question dead to rights, that's when he start talking about Disneyland <laughs> and hanging out on Mars with Larry Bird. I'm like, you were fine a second ago. Like, <laughs> You know, this feels weird. I don't know why more world leaders don't do that. You know, a lot of them, oh, just start doing the Biden card. You get in trouble. That's what Putin should do. <laughs> Think about it. Putin would buy a lot of goodwill if he just fell down a flight of steps every day. <laughs> if every day for a month, Putin just, oop, oop, like just every day. You'd be catching people a month from now being like, he's a fucking war criminal. And we'd be like, yeah, but it looked like he got bad knees. Leave him alone. <laughs> they, try to, they try to interview him. They're like, why are you still laying siege to Ukraine? And he's like, Ukraine? Is that one of my grandbabies? Like, oh, okay. <laughs> and they're even coming for Hunter now. You saw Hunter got indicted. That's wild. As, oof, they really coming for the Bidens hard, you know? I love Hunter. I really do. I really do. No, no, hear me out. I do. I love Hunter because I'm just so glad that the first person to smoke crack in the White House was white. That's, that's beautiful. That is absolutely incredible. Especially if you know the history of crack in the U.S. You're like, wow, yes. Thank goodness. It really makes the White House to crack relationship feel like it's come full circle now. Yeah? <laughs> I am disappointed, though. I'm not going to lie to you. I wish, I, I really do wish that Hunter would just get Joe to smoke crack. <laughs> that would be the most fire presidency of all time. I know nobody's on board with this, but hear me out, okay? First of all, Biden will never fall again, all right? Crackheads do not fall, okay? You could push Biden and he still hit an angle. Like, it's like, I'm telling you, he'd never go down again. You'd never have to worry. He would skip steps on the way up. My man would be fucking feeling himself. You'd never have a boring press conference again. Biden press conferences are snooze fest right now. Just, uh, 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 you know what I mean? Not on crack, not on crack. Not on crack. He'd be like, what? What was that? He got to scream because he sold the mic for money for more crack. But like, what was that? <laughs> and Republicans would love if Biden was on crack because he'd finally be as bad of a president as they've been saying he is. <laughs> Republicans could finally be like, he sold Indiana for $6 to China, all right? <laughs> what the fuck we gonna do? We got citizens over there. <laughs> and then as liberals, we would love if Biden was on crack because we'd finally have a Trump. <laughs> you know what I mean? We act like we don't need a Trump, but we need one. We really do. As liberals, we need a Trump. We care about everybody feeling too much, but we get Biden smoking crack, Joe just going off. He not can in control what he's saying. We'd finally have a bully on our side, you know? Marjorie Taylor Greene be up there like, Joe Biden, you're a piece of shit. And then Joe, fully cracked out. <laughs> Fully cracked out. It's like, oh, Mart, I'm a piece of shit. Well, you a lonely bitch. Aren't you getting divorced this year? <laughs> Hope those conspiracy theories could keep you warm, lonely bitch. <laughs> oh, be incredible. You would have to like rein him in, though. You'd see, you'd see Joe trying to try to wash the windshields of Air Force One. <laughs> Mr. President, get down. Get down right now. <laughs> oh, it'd be dope, man. How do I put this? I've, I've, I'll be honest with you, I've watched some porn before in my life. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> and this is my thing. <laughs> porn... It gives people unrealistic expectations, you know what I mean? And we all know what they say about men, that porn gives men unrealistic expectations of sex. Because porn 
makes men think, oh, if I just touch her elbow with my penis, she gonna lose it. You know what I mean? Like, if I just touch you, I'm like, ah! Like, it's, thank you. But it's not, it's not just for men, it's for everyone. Porn gives everyone unrealistic expectations of sex, you know? Like, it makes men think that the sex, they're about to be sex gods, and it makes women think that the sex is about to be, like, good or whatever, you know what I mean? Everybody's gonna be disappointed. doing hey yeah i'm gonna tell you a story i got invited to a party which was big for me okay i don't get invited to a lot of parties all right i get there i didn't know there would be hard drugs at this party you know and like i don't judge or anything it's just that someone offered me heroin right like, here's the thing, hierarchy for me is that, like, weed, everybody understands weed. Hey, what, whatever, you know what I mean? Cocaine, you're living on the edge. Crack, you've made a mistake. <laughs> but no one doing heroin has a five-year plan. No one, okay? <laughs> if you do heroin, you either play the guitar really well or you just have a lot of feelings. I don't know what to say about you. So he offered me heroin like it was normal. And I didn't want to not seem cool, but I didn't want to take the heroin. And so he passed it to me, and I was like, no thanks, man. I am stuffed. I could not have any more heroin today. I have had my fill. Mm. I am good. Thank you. I live in New York now. I moved to New York from Chicago, and I wasn't ready. I'm not good. Lots of things I was not ready for. One was the rats. I don't know if you guys have rats here, but no one has rats like New York because the rest of the world's rats have shame. I saw a rat inside, all right? And he saw me see him, and instead of scurrying away, he was just like, what's up, dog? Like, that's... What is that? What is the... And I, I, I'm 800 times bigger than him. I could step on him and kill him. And he was like, but you won't, though. Like, that I'd never been more scared. I saw my friend got a cat Got a cat and was like, it's so great. She eats all the like, she eats little roaches. She, she might even get after a rat. The cat was scared of the rat. The cat was like, I'm fine. I'm going to get on this ledge and wait for him to leave. All right. <laughs> it was devastating. The other thing I wasn't ready for was the third graders. <laughs> I don't know what it is about being born and raised in Brooklyn or the Bronx that makes you such a natural bully, but they're monsters. Okay. <laughs> I'm terror. They're little terrorists, all right? I'm more scared of third graders now than I was in third grade. I actually asked to get off work early so I could make sure I was in my house when they got out of school because I not want to run into them anymore. They're little monsters. Like, I was just walking down the street, and one woman was like, Hey! Hey! First of all, too much bass for a third grader, all right? I turned around, almost called him sir by accident. I didn't know who was talking to me. I turned, he's like, Hey! What's up, bird shoulders? I don't know what that means. But I went home and cried afterward. You ever have someone make fun of you and it does, you don't even get it, but it hits such a core part of who you are that you get hurt anyway? Like I was sitting, I don't, my body hasn't changed since it happened. I probably still have bird shoulders. I have no idea what it is. I have a lot of fears since I'm little. You know, I'm scared of a lot of things. My biggest fear above like rats or third graders or anything else is just finding a dead white girl. <laughs> In fact, I think that's why there's no black ghost hunters because we don't want to come in a room and just... I'm too black to just find her. There's gonna be an investigation. There's gonna be leads, okay? People are gonna be calling in. They're gonna use a picture of me on the news. It's not gonna be a good one. It's not gonna be a picture with me looking like the first picture day or something. It's gonna be me stubbing my toe like. <laughs> and you're gonna see that on the news and be like, he did it, look at him. 
who smiles bottom teeth first. He is a murderer. In fact, I'm so scared that I would walk in, see her dead, scream. Someone runs and be like, what did you do? No, that was my scream. That was not her. I know it's hard to believe, but I screamed the way she would have screamed had this been me to her. But please don't. Okay, I'll go to jail now, and I won't last. I had to take a flight. I, another fear that's creeping towards the top of the list is uh, tiny planes, you know? I had to take a tiny plane. I didn't think it would be a big deal. It only seated eight people. It's the tiniest plane I've ever been on. It was so small that there was no cockpit. So I could see the captain and the co-pilot. I could hear both of them. At one point during the flight, the captain was like, whoa, and I was like, what, what, what? Oh my God, what? No, don't act like I can't hear you, sir. We're talking right now, okay? Do I need to get up ahead? Don't tell me to sit down. I can't stand up. The plane's not that big. <laughs> I should have known something was wrong because I got to the gate and they wanted to weigh my carry-ons. Which never happens. But I was like, fine, backpacks, 13 pounds, laptops, four pounds with the case. And then they were like, how much do you weigh? And I was like, how small is the plane? <laughs> How small is the plane? You need to know my 125-pound body weighs 125 pounds. And then I get to the plane, I'm like, that makes sense. Okay. Fair enough. This is the smallest plane I've ever been on. And, like, it took, like, this, this plane, I, I know it's not nice. I know it's not kind. But, like, I was the youngest person on this flight by far. Everyone else was 80 and up. So a real thought I had on the flight was... This is heaven's waiting room. I got to get out of here. This is terrible. She already looked dead. And her, her soul just had to step out to get to heaven. I want to be up here with people dying. <laughs> and you know that overhead compartment that's supposed to drop an air mask if there's too much turbulence? That's not there at all. It's just little Bibles fall out because you're going to die. So you might as well get a verse in or something. You're dead, okay? It was terrible. And like... We were, we were flying, and like, I, I just, I was, I was having these heart palpitations and everything. I couldn't, I didn't know if I would last or anything. And then I, I don't know how planes work, okay? I can't pretend. I'm not a genius, all right? But at least the big planes take off right away. It took this little plane so long to take off, I thought we were going to drive there. <laughs> this plane is actually leaving the ground and coming back down, and leaving the ground and coming back down to the point where I looked at the pilot, and I was like, do we all need to jump at the same time? What's going to keep me in the air? I just want to get to the place, please. <laughs> Guys, I'm Josh Johnson. Thanks so much. You have a great night. Appreciate it.